Good morning. <laughs> My name is Alada Taylor from the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to this uh, presentation by astronaut Reed Wiseman, who will share its experiences while living on the International Space Station. We're delighted to have all of you this morning, and especially our future astronauts. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Our youth in the audience, thank you so much for being here. Uh, astronaut Reed Wiseman, call name Tonto. I thought that was interesting. Uh, anybody know what Tonto means? Any of the young people who Tonto was? No? Okay. He was companion of the Lone Ranger. Oh, Tonto. Uh, but Reed is an American astronaut, an engineer, and a naval navigator. He was selected in 2009 of one of nine candidates from 3,500 applicants to begin astronaut training with NASA Astronaut Group 20. At the time, he was serving as a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy, flying as a pilot with Strike Flight of Squadron 103 on the aircraft carrier USS Dwight E. Eisenhower. Astronaut Wiseman said he often went to U.S. Navy Blue Angels uh, as a youth, and he developed a desire to become an astronaut when he saw a space shuttle in person in 2001. And I thought, well, that wasn't too long ago, 2001. And when you see him, you'll see that wasn't too long ago. <laughs> uh, astronaut Wiseman took part in his first space flight as part of Expedition 4041 on the International Space Station. The mission was for six months in duration and lasted from May 28 to November 10 in 2014. He is a graduate of Delaney High School in the suburbs of Timonius, Maryland. He's from Baltimore. Yay, Baltimore for him. Uh, he earned a degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a master's in systems engineering from Baltimore's John Hopkins University in 2006. He is married, and even as young as he looks, he has two children, two daughters. Uh, colleagues, please join me in welcoming to the podium astronaut Reed Weissman, who will share his experience. Let's give him a hand. I feel like I'm in a cafe. I like this setting. This is nice. Um, so I grew up in Baltimore, and uh, I was up there two days ago. It's hot. It's hotter here, I think, than in Houston right now. Um, and so let, let's uh, jump through this slide deck. We'll take a little look of, uh, of life in space. And uh, for the kids, maybe you can maybe feel like you're floating there with me a little bit in this. That's the impression I want to give when we get through this, so we'll see. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, there we go. So uh, just a, a little teaser is uh, going to be some time-lapse uh, video that we did from the space station. So see if you can maybe spy some thunderstorms, the edge of the earth, there's some great thunderstorms there. Uh, I think I'll pan the camera straight down on the next one and you can just see lightning creeping and crawling its way through the clouds. It's really fascinating. Uh, we're not flying quite that fast. Uh, they're sped up. This is uh, all of Africa coming up on the Mediterranean. You can see that crisp contrast. This is the Bahamas. Absolutely beautiful look to look down on the Bahamas from up there. Um, and then the Aurora. You, you can never get tired of looking at the Aurora when you're up there. And we had some really fascinating Aurora. Uh, that's Europe looking to the kind of northeast and you can see the Aurora way up way up to the north. And that's a, a moonlit night. You can see the kind of the moon reflection in the clouds. Really beautiful. Uh, and then just, uh, just over the horizon, there's Orion's belt rising. I thought it was always really cool to see Orion rising. It was, it's a constellation I think most kids know because it's so easy to spot and uh, it's fun to look at that. Uh, before I launched, I was trying to put in perspective, like we've been flying into space for a long time as, as Earthlings. Um, and I found this number on the internet. I think it was 535 and we're up to 538 now, but that's the number of people that have been in low Earth orbit or beyond. Uh, so this includes all of our moonwalkers from the late 60s and 70s. And at first, 538 seemed like a lot of folks. And then uh, in my training, I used to fly the A380 from uh, Houston over to Frankfurt to go visit ESA. 
and it's a double-decker airplane, real big airplane. This is how many people sit in coach. So when you really think about it, we haven't really sent all that many people into space. And so it still is extremely special. Uh, we're doing a lot of great work up there, but just having that human perspective, that human experience in space was very unique and, uh, and we enjoyed it. Uh, I was selected uh, in 2009, and this is my class. I just, for the kids, I just wanted to put this up and kind of go through a few of these folks. Uh, so we have people from Canada, US, and Japan are uh, all members of our class. We had, uh, I think it was 14 total. And uh, if you really go through here, we have medical doctors. We have, I'm just going to look at it as I go. We have a 767 pilot, uh, a, a Japanese diving medical officer, a F-15 pilot, a trauma surgeon, uh, an American test pilot, flew F-22s, an American surgeon. We have a Ebola researcher, the uh, blonde girl there, Kate Rubens, Dr. Rubens, was doing Ebola research in the Congo when she got picked up. Uh, Jeanette Epps, uh, she's worked at a lot of crazy places if you read her bio. Uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, CIA was the last place I think she worked. I'm not sure she'll admit it. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, down in the front row, we have uh, a couple pilots kind of across. The guy in the center is a flight test engineer in the Air Force, myself, and then uh, the guy on the lower right is, uh, is an Army uh, engineer. So, the thing I love about our class is everybody comes from this operational background. And when NASA looks to hire astronauts in, the one thing that they don't want to take the time to teach us is operational upbringing, basically. So they, they hire that in, and that's what they pull in. So each one of us was passionate about our jobs before we got to NASA. And, uh, but we all had that operational flavor in our backgrounds. A little bit about training, just to walk through what it takes to get into space. And this will only be just a couple minutes. but. Uh, one of the cool things you get to do is when you fly in a Soyuz, you, if in an emergency, you could land anywhere on our planet. And so we had to do water survival. Here we're doing uh, winter survival. And you can see we built a teepee using the parachute from our, from our spacecraft. And you look at the top of the teepee. It's starting to brown a little bit because it was minus 30 centigrade out there. And uh, we would build a fire at night. And so that was kind of browning the top of our teepee as the smoke would go out of there. So we got to live in a teepee for two and a half days. And, uh, and you go out thinking that this is, the only thing we had was stuff that you would find in a Soyuz. So we had little chiclets, uh, a couple crackers, some candy, some water, and, uh, and then this, this tent that we built for ourselves. Uh, but what you find here is it's less about wilderness training and more about crew uh, bonding. And so this was my two crewmates that I flew in the Soyuz with. And at the end of this, we were kind of best friends. Uh, you can't live in minus 30 degrees and not, well, I guess you could end up as enemies, but we ended up as best friends. Uh, of course, we got to train for spacewalks, and uh, that's the, every astronaut wants to get the chance to go out and do a spacewalk. And we didn't know if we were going to do one. We didn't have one pre-planned before we launched. Uh, but you can see there uh, the thickness of the suit. My pants uh, are pretty big, Stay Puff Marshmallow kind of pants. And then my left hand is holding the, the hard upper torso unit we'll, that we have to crawl into uh, to get ourselves in the spacesuit. And then over there, you can see the gloves laying on the desk. Um, and we go in the pool an awful lot. We have a huge pool down in Houston called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. It's 40 feet deep. And, uh, and that spacesuit that I'm wearing in that picture, I'm going to spend six hours underwater with no breaks. The only thing we have is water. And, uh, and that suit originally was uh, qualified as a, as a class one spacesuit, so it could have been worn outside. And then they degrade them and we wear them into the pool. So it's exactly what we would wear outside the space station. And that is some of the best training I got uh, in preparation for flight was working in the neutral buoyancy lab. We have no doctors up there. And so if somebody gets sick, like this poor... Uh, I don't know, specimen that doesn't have legs there. Uh, we have to learn how to fix them. And so we spent a lot of our time training on, on basic CPR, first aid, uh, things of that sort. And you can see myself and Alex Gerst there uh, working on that mannequin, trying to resuscitate him. We didn't do it. He didn't come back to life, unfortunately. Um, I love this picture. This is in a, a Russian vacuum chamber. And uh, part of the training is gaining confidence that these systems will work when you're in this crazy environment of space. And uh, so right now, there is no air behind that door. That's just me sitting there in a total vacuum. Well, as total as we can get on Earth. And uh, in my Russian Sokol suit, which I'll wear in the Soyuz spacecraft when I launch and re-enter. And so I sat in there for about two hours and just enjoyed my, my peace and quiet. And every little crink in the suit would be like, oh, what was that? And then the little click over here, oh, what was that? But over two hours, you just get real confident. And you start to understand that this suit really works. And it will save my life if I need it to. And that's the exact suit that I wore uh, on the Soyuz, both uphill and downhill. So it was a great confidence builder. And then we have to learn uh, how to be our own researchers. And so here I was uh, participating in a study that looked at all my heart valves. Uh, and my arteries, and so I'm learning on the ground how to do ultrasound on my own heart, and there's uh, one of the researchers there, one of our trainers, and he's showing me, teaching me what I'm looking at, 
And then I would have to take this uh, knowledge and, and put it up on the space station when I was up there. And if you, you always hear like TMI, too much information. If you hold an ultrasound up to your heart and look at it on the screen, it's like a weird, like your brain does not understand that you're looking at your own, it was too, way too much information to see your own valves flopping around there. And, and, uh, but it's, it's cool. Um, and then a lot of time in the Soyuz trainer. And uh, you can see there, uh, everything is in Russian. Uh, our manuals are in Russian. And uh, it's not a very modern cockpit. So it takes a little while to get used to all those buttons and, uh, and valves and things like that. And in the end, uh, when you first look at it, it looks a little crazy. But in the end, you realize it's actually pretty elegant design. And, uh, and you can operate this machine very, very well. Uh, but it is tight in there. Towards the end of our astronaut training, uh, we got a chance to go in this C-9 spacecraft, or C-9 uh, aircraft. It's just like a regular commercial airplane. And doing a series of parabolas, you get to learn how to float. And so remember the picture at the beginning I showed you of my classmates all standing there very formal. Uh, this was our first experience floating. And as you can see by the smiles on our faces, it's no fun whatsoever. Uh, we, had, we had a terrible time in that thing. But oh, that was a great day. And we would get about 20 seconds of weightlessness on each of these parabolas. And so that was our first experience, 20 seconds at a time of floating. And towards the end of it, uh, they kind of give you the keys to your rocket once you've graduated your training and you're ready to fly. So this is uh, my crew in front of the back end of our Soyuz spacecraft. You can see it's a lot of power. It's an awful lot of power. And they get that spacecraft. I'm a big train buff. I grew up, I love trains. I always had trains when I was a kid. And so it really warmed my heart to know that my rocket would ride out to the pad on the back of a train. And there it is, uh, heading to the pad, sun just barely rising, and uh, helicopter providing support. Yeah, it's, I just think that's a beautiful picture. All right, so uh, who I flew into space with. On the left there, you have Alex Gerst. He's a German volcanologist, a geophysicist, a PhD, and an extremely, extremely smart human being. After spending some time with Alex, I understand why you want to go buy a BMW or a Mercedes. I mean, it, he is the ultimate of German precision right there. And, uh, and when you fly into space, um, you, you need sometimes, you need somebody serious who is extremely gifted and intelligent. And that was the, our guy on our crew. I mean, Jer uh, Alex, he was a book of knowledge. He knows everything about everything. And it was great to work with him. In the center there is Max Sarayev. He's a Russian. He was the commander of our, of our Soyuz. And he is a great guy. We, we always said we were brothers from another mother because we were, we were two peas in a pod. And uh, he was a, a Russian fighter pilot. Uh, he, when I joined the Navy, he was our enemy. He was the guy we trained against. And here I am flying into space with him. And, I'm not sure you can see it on the screen, but I do have to point out, buried down in all the hands, there's a pink Band-Aid on my finger, and that's a Hello Kitty Band-Aid. Uh, I cut my finger that morning, and my, my daughters who were with me in Russia, and of course, they brought out the Hello Kitty Band-Aid, and I went through my Russian qual sims wearing Hello Kitty, and we called it Privyet Koshka. And I don't think the Russians cared for that very much, but our crew loved it. Thought it was great. All right, so let's get off the planet and, uh, and off into space. Uh, a lot of people ask me what's the hardest part about flying into space, and for me, it was this moment right here. Saying goodbye to your kids is extremely difficult. Uh, then we roll out to the pad. We're in our spacesuits there. And this was uh, the head of the Russian Space Agency at the time. And uh, he just leaned in and said, we built you a great rocket. It's going to work super. And uh, that was exactly what he needed to tell us at the time. Uh, so you can see we're, we're walking up the ladder, about to get in the elevator and right up to the top of our rocket. And we sit in there for about two or three hours. And then uh, it's time to go to space. And uh, the engines start rolling about 10 seconds before liftoff. And you can feel it rumbling. And, um, and then they kick in. And it's not a big jolt. There you can see liftoff. It just shakes a little bit. It's not like the old shuttle days. Uh, we launched in the middle of the night. And there's my family. They're just being lit up by a rocket plume. There's my brother, one of my best friends, my mom in the lower left there. Um, but it was, it was really, uh, it was, I was glad they got to watch. I wish my view from inside was better. But we're covered in a shroud. So we can't even see outside at, at liftoff. Uh, that's a three-stage rocket. Now imagine this, especially for the kids. You can see it's, it's calm. It's just like driving your car down the road. You're just in a more uncomfortable clothing. Um, but it's nine and a half minutes from liftoff until we're in space. And we go in that nine and a half minutes from zero to about 17,000 miles an hour. So if you can imagine your parents driving really crazy, um, that's what the ride is like. Um, you, you get up to about four, four and a half times uh, Earth's gravity. So you're getting pushed back in your seat. And here is engine cutout. It's actually pretty dynamic when the engine stops. So that's nine and a half minutes after liftoff, and now we're in space. And this is, uh, this is great, because you can see some raw human emotion of having survived ascent. And look at Max in the middle. He is so happy to be alive. Um, this is Giraffity, one of my daughter's toys, floating there. And uh, we had a GoPro in the cabin with us. And this is, this is absolutely the first look outside. I mean, this is it's just amazing. Um, 
And in my time, just being a space lover, I had looked at pictures and video like this so many times that I was really worried when I got to space. Like, would it be like this? I mean, would it kind of just be, okay, that's pretty awesome. When you look outside with your own eyes and your own brain and you get to assemble this whole picture, there is no video, there is no photograph you could ever look at that even comes within 10% of the beauty of what you get to look out at outside that window. Uh, it's absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, that was a great moment, getting to look outside with the sun up. Uh, it's about six and a half hours from launch until we get to the space station. So there on the left, you can see our little Soyuz coming up and docking on the right uh, to the International Space Station, where we would spend the next six months of our lives. It's a totally automated system. We never had to touch the controls on the way up. Uh, everything worked perfectly for us. Flawless, flawless ascent and, uh, and rendezvous. And, uh, and there we are. And I've been strapped in to the Soyuz the whole time. So this is really my first chance to float when we open this hatch and we float through. And I had dreamed of this moment so long in my life. I thought that it was going to be magic. Like, you know, I just thought it would be magic. And I can tell you, at that point in time, it is not a magical experience. Um, I didn't necessarily feel great. Uh, I was very timid. You can see I'm coming through here. I, I, we were going up. But in the trainers on Earth, we're going across. You can see Swanee just grabs my hand and pulls me in. He's like, all right, come on, we need to get going. Um, and so it was really kind of interesting. I felt a little sick to my stomach. And uh, I had just dreamed of this moment for so long. And then when it happens, there are so many different sensory overload things going on in your body that you really just want to go to bed. I think that's, re <laughs> that's really what you want to do after you get to the space. So you want to look outside for a second, then you want get, to get to bed. And that's basically what we did that first night. Um, so to kind of feel what it was like up there, I, I took a few uh, of my first day uh, Twitter uh, feed comments just to relive a little walk down memory lane for me. But I couldn't believe how easily I got disoriented and lost on the space station. You got to imagine, I, I got hired in 2009 and I launched in 14, so that's five years. And I had trained every day in that five years to be on the space station. But Building 9 in Houston, the space station is laid out on a floor and there's walkways around it and it's under 1G. And you take gravity away and then put me up on this big machine, and I was getting lost. It was pretty fascinating. <laughs> um, and I felt full all the time. It felt like there was food up to there every minute for the first two or three days. Like, I knew I had to eat and I knew I had to drink, but I didn't want to because I just felt like there's no room. There's no way. If you imagine, everything in your stomach is just floating up to the top. And uh, your body gets used to it, though. So after about two or three days, I said I was getting better at floating. Um, sorry if that's running off the bottom. But I was still knocking stuff off the walls. You know, like uh, when a baby comes over to your house and you kind of have to kid-proof it, they do the same thing on the space station. They have to take all the, all the heavy science off the walls because we're going to knock it off. And uh, it's funny. There were some great collisions in those first few days. And then we all noted that the tops of our feet hurt because we want to feel like we're under Earth's gravity. So we always go and lock our feet under handrails and stand up on the space station. And you actually get calluses and blisters on the tops of your feet from that. Um, and then my first run. Uh, it was about, I guess it was day three, and if you've never felt food bouncing off the top of your stomach, I don't recommend trying it. it it's so weird that I stopped halfway through, I grabbed Swanee, our commander, and I asked him if this was a normal experience, and he said, yeah, that's normal, you'll get used to it. Um, but uh, it took me a while to get to love this treadmill, and in the end, I did love it, but it took a while. And then day four, I woke up, and it was like a switch had gone off in my head, and I just woke up feeling superb. And, uh, and I knew this is where I wanted to be. Like space, I joke, I, I think we're going out on NASA TV, but it's the ultimate lazy person's dream. I mean, you just push like that and you float from one side to the other. You can pick up a refrigerator with your pinkies and push it over to your crewmate. Um, it's glorious. And then when you get bored with that, you go look out the window and the view is, it's spectacular. Um, so here's just a quick uh, schematic. I think most people in this audience are pretty familiar with the space station, but, uh, but just very quick. Anything that runs horizontal there, that's all truss, and that's support. We don't live inside that horizontal portion of the space station. You can see out at the end of the horizontal pieces are the solar arrays, and that's all our power. Everything comes from the sun. We don't have a nuclear reactor. We don't have a gas generator up there, nothing. We, we just pull our power from the sun, and uh, it is amazing what the sun can power. Um, if you look at the vertical running portion, that's what we call the stack, and that's where we all live. The part that's at the bottom half of the screen right now, that's built by the Russians. And, uh, and then the part that's at the top half is built by US, Europe, and Japan. And uh, what I'm going to do on this next slide is uh, there's a video, and I start from the very back of the space station. They told me not to use the laser pointer, but I'm going to start there, and I'm going to float all the way up to there. 
And for those of you that have seen tours inside the space station, I would say listen to the sound of the fans as you go through. And look at the volume as you go from the Russian segment into the US segment. It's just very, very neat. For those of you that have never seen a stack fly through, just watch, because it's cool to float. OK, here we are at the back of the ATV. We're at the very back end of the space station. We're going 18,000 miles an hour in this direction. And so I'm going to kick off, and we'll do a quick fly through the stack of the International Space Station. We'll pass some fun things on the way. Oh, Toby, Utra. Dinner table again. Got Max. Ah! <laughs> it's very difficult to squeeze through the Russian sector. <laughs> Especially when Max is here. <laughs> And now we're going through into the FGB. FGB is us, basically a Looks storage like we got module. A nice, nice flight path here. We should be able to make it. All right, down into Node One. Station's going to open up. Butch, go high. Here's Butch Wilmore. Quick foot tag. Quick aileron roll through the lab into the ball form. A little spin into node two over Alex's crew quarters. And here we are at the very front end of the International Space Station. Still going 18,000 miles an hour. A lot of people ask if you get claustrophobic. You can't get claustrophobic in there. I mean, that's a big, big, big machine. So that gives you a little, all I did was just go straight up. I didn't go off into any of the other modules that go left, right, up and down. So uh, it's a bit bigger than that, but that's the main portion of the space station. You can see it's pretty crazy. It's a pretty crazy place to live. Now, I, did, I do have to point out that um, I came home, I launched into space and I'd never heard of a selfie stick. I come home from space and apparently this is all the rage. I mean, I went with my kids to an amusement park and everybody was filming themselves, which I didn't understand too much, but, um, but that was my selfie stick. We had found this enormous wrench and I'm pretty sure that it doesn't have a, a, a bolt that it goes to on the space station. So I took that and I had some Kapton tape with a D4, Nikon D4 camera and that was my invention. I thought I was going to be rich. And then the president's walking around with one of these things, and that was the end. Uh, that's me in the US lab there with my selfie stick. All right, so um, to give the kids kind of an idea of, of living without gravity, um, we put this together. Um, and the, the, so there's a big sphere of water. And we stuck a GoPro inside the sphere. And you can see all these little air bubbles that are living inside this water bubble. We had stuck an Alka-Seltzer in there and thought it would be the coolest experiment ever uh, for a Sunday afternoon. And it didn't really do much except make all those little spheres, but that's why they're in there. And so you can see what it's like to kind of live inside this water bubble. Uh, there's me filming. Here's Swanee. He's the commander of the space station, and he looks like a little kid. He's so excited. It was so much fun. He, uh, he stuck his hand in the water bubble, and it started creeping up his arm, and uh, it actually kind of destroyed the water bubble. Uh, you can see Oleg Artemyev right there. He's uh, one of our Russian colleagues. Um, and it got me thinking after doing that of, I really want to bounce water bubbles off each other. So right there, the water kind of joined into one bubble, the two bubbles. But it seemed completely possible to just bounce using surface tension, just to bounce these water bubbles off each other. And so I got out this uh, syringe with a Teflon catheter. And uh, if I hit it hard enough, the water would add to the bubble. And if I hit it soft enough, the water would just bounce off this bubble. Um, you can see my face through the bubble. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. I had not showered in a long time, so I joked that this is kind of the closest I got to a shower while I was up there. Um, and then I would think, what would happen if I put an air bubble in there? Would it kind of pop the water bubble? What would it do? So I'm going to add a little water, and then I get this kind of, oh, let's put an air bubble in there. So the next thing I'm going to introduce is just air. And it's so wild, it bounces off the inner surface tension of that water bubble, and it just lives in there. You, it even works as kind of a, a lens as well. You can see my face here in a little bit. And I'll hit it from the side with some water right here and just watch this thing bounce around. And then we had to know what it was like to put a human in the water bubble. And, uh, and so we elected Alex Gerst because he had no hair, so he was going to be the guy we were going to stick in the water bubble. Actually, he wanted to do it. And so we made one more big water bubble up there. And, uh, and this is Alex going in. Uh, 
Luca Parmitano, about a year earlier, had had uh, water intrusion in his spacesuit, and he said how close he came to drowning in there, and it wasn't a lot of water. And the first thing Alex said after this, you can see we had towels there, I mean, we were ready, and we, yes, yes, NASA, we evaporated all that water back into the cabin. It was reclamated. Um, but the first thing Alex said was just how scary that all felt. He could feel water going up his nostrils, in his ear, it was creeping into his mouth. And he said, you know, if I was in a spacesuit right there, that'd be the scariest thing. I mean, you can't get that water off of you. So it was really kind of fascinating to see. Um, all right, so that's a little perspective on, on fun and, and living in zero gravity with the water. Uh, but what are we really doing up there? And here I'm gonna attempt to do a flip. That's not what we're really doing up there. But this is like my third or fourth day up there and I mess it up. So I can tell I'm gonna hit the floor. So I protected protected against that fiasco. Um, but our mission is 100% is science. Assembly is complete, and we're up there executing the science mission every day. So for myself, Swanee, and, and Alex, we're working four to five hours a day at a minimum on some pretty good science. And, uh, and this video is just gonna kind of show a, a snippet of what we were working on up there. Um, a lot of, uh, this was a, some research with MIT and Florida Institute of Technology. Uh, some of the data that we pulled from one of these actually uh, was this fluid experiment and uh, the data was so intriguing that they're pumping the results right into the SLS program for a fuel tank design. So that was pretty good to see. Uh, this was trying to use electromagnetics alone to have satellites kind of fly autonomously off each other. And uh, from my perspective it didn't work too well, but from the research perspective it worked great. The science is what kept me motivated up there. Looking down at the earth is incredible, but when you get to talk to the researchers and when we're talking to them real time as we're doing their experiments and you hear the fascination in their voice, uh, it really, it kind of lit my fire. It was really great. This is a furnace. Uh, I love this experiment because we would maintain this furnace and then at night ground controllers would turn it on and do the experiments in this furnace. And this is what it looks like inside. It's a, a floating sphere of, uh, of fuel that they light on fire. And then uh, this one actually off gasses a little bit, kind of looks like a little spaceship flying off to the side. Uh, I was also the resident uh, burn guy up there. I spent about a month and a half doing this experiment, which was called BASS, where we were just burning solids. And uh, getting the thumbs up from Mission Control to burn stuff in space was great for me. I loved that. Uh, that was really good. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I was burning in a glove box. There was no chance of contaminating the cabin, but it was a really good time. And then we would have cargo ships come up, like SpaceX uh, and Orbital would come up, and they would just deliver us hundreds and hundreds of experiments, and we would have to crank through these, and uh, it made our days pretty busy. By the time we left, we had uh, a bunch of fish, we had a bunch of mice, we had worms, snails, we were a, a regular, I think we even had fruit flies, so we, we kind of turned into a zoo. And I loved, I loved watching our, our animal friends up there, and uh, watching the mice integrate into space and learn how to live in space was really amazing. Um, at first, they were very timid, and they would just kind of hold onto the side. And after about two weeks, you would look in, and they would kind of be floating around. And after a month or two, uh, they were pushing off from their food and floating over to the wall and running around and making their own little exercise network in there. Uh, really amazing stuff. We spent about, uh, I don't know, probably a quarter of our time looking in in ourselves and what is going on with the human body. So uh, Scott Kelly is up there for a year right now and uh, I know he's having a lot of fun participating in all this but uh, I got to do a lot of it too. Right there I'm looking at uh, my calf muscle on the ultrasound. Really neat to watch my calf go from the back of my leg and it kind of regrew on the front of my leg because I was just using different muscles while I was up there. Um, eyesight is a big problem because fluid goes up into our heads and it kind of stays there when you're in zero G and so there we're looking at uh, blood flow in the back of my eye and then a very awkward feeling, if you've never tried it, is uh, throwing gel on the ultrasound and then plugging that thing into your eyeball and uh, getting to look at the shape of your eye through ultrasound. And uh, really neat to get to see all that. Um, and we got to take care of our bodies too. So we would spend about two hours a day working out. We have this machine, it's called A-RED, which lets us squat up to 600 pounds. So if any of you guys become power lifters, you're fine in space. I never got there, I got about 350 pounds. That was my, my best. And then the good old treadmill, which is mounted on the wall facing straight down. And so this is an earth orientation of our treadmill. And our treadmill is right next to the outhouse, which is our bathroom. Um, we don't have a whole lot of space up there, so you gotta do what you gotta do. It took a while to get used to running, and then once I was, I was used to it, it was great. Um, and since we don't have any scientists up there doing the kind of the evaluation of the research real time, uh, anything that comes out of our body, and we take urine samples, blood samples, skin samples, saliva samples, and we freeze all of that and, uh, and send it down. I kind of like this video because right here at the end, I'd lost this desk and pack and Swanee grabs it and it, 
It highlights how hard it is to manage everything when it's floating. And I was so scared to lose a blood sample or a urine sample, and there goes all that data. Um, so we would always check that surrounding after we would get this stuff in our, in our freezer. And uh, why I was wearing short sleeve shirts, working on a minus 100 degree centigrade freezer, I don't know. It wasn't the procedure to wear a long sleeve, but I can tell you I started. Um, that is cold, cold, cold storage right there. Um, all right, and then some of my favorite work up there, uh, I'm getting better at the flips here, but I'm still not quite there. Um, some of my favorite work was running the maintenance. And so we don't, we, we, we don't have too many spare parts. We gotta work everything uh, while we're up there and fix it. That's our uh, water reclamation system. So it takes uh, sweat from the cabin, condensation, and urine, and it runs it through a recycling system and then uh, pumps that back into our drinking water. We can also strip it down and make oxygen out of it. Uh, pretty cool. And then there I'm working on this gigantic furnace. I also have some science attached to my forehead monitoring my internal temperature so I didn't look too cool there. Um, but just working all this, it makes you realize how big this team is supporting you, thousands of people, and that's the only way we get this job done. There's there Swanee and I changing out a pump on a spacesuit, and uh, not designed to be changed on orbit, uh, but we did it anyway, and then we'd wear that suit outside. Our treadmill broke, so we had to fix that. Our toilet always broke. Well, not always, but it broke a good bit. So there's Swanee, uh, a PhD in computer science, working on the toilet, getting it back up and running. And I tell you, if the toilet breaks, it's all stopped. The crew wants that thing back in a hurry. We have two up there, one in the Russian side and one in the US side. And uh, so if we had a couple times where both were broken at the same time, and that's definitely all stopped. Um, all right, and then every astronaut's dream is to get to do a spacewalk. It's like the, uh, if, if any of you are race fans, you want to see a crash. You don't want to admit that you want to see a crash, but you probably do want to see a crash at some point. Uh, and when you're up there inside, you're always secretly hoping something will break outside. Um, you don't want to admit it because that would be terrible to admit that, but you are hoping it. And so uh, come about October, we got the chance to go out and do two spacewalks. Uh, first one was with Alex Gerst, and that was great. Two rookies going out the door. First time in the space station program we had done that. And if you want to up the gains and up the nerves a good bit, uh, that was it for me because I was really nervous I wouldn't be able to get the airlock hatch open. I had to open the hatch, and it's kind of a little awkward way that it comes up and rotates back. And I thought about that for about 100 hours before doing that EVA, because what would have happened if we had depressed the airlock and then I couldn't get that hatch open and we're just stuck in there and then we have to cancel an EVA because I couldn't open, a, open the door? That would have been terrible. But uh, I'm kind of scared of heights. You can see me there on the bottom. I'm, I'm stuck out on one of these things. Alex took this picture with a, a fisheye lens, 10.5 millimeter. So the Earth isn't quite that curved. You can see it's a little bent. Uh, but man, what a fascinating, what a fascinating view. We're outside for about six and a half hours. You got a little, little drink bag of water. And before we even go out the hatch, it's four hours in that suit. So it's a very long day. Uh, this is the hardest thing I've ever done, mentally, physically, it doesn't matter. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. I've landed on a, on a Navy ship over 500 times, a bunch of them at night, but this takes the cake for difficulty. Uh, and also takes the cake for just a ridiculously cool thing to get to go do. Um, all right, and now what I, what I wanna end with is uh, some views from the inside looking out, because this is, this is my favorite space pastime, and it's, I, I love sharing this. So, with a few exceptions, all these pictures are gonna be with about a 40 to 50 millimeter lens. So this is, if you wanna know what it looks like, this is, this is what it looks like. How's that coming up there? You can see my two Nikons there in the cupola. The cupola has six windows in a 360 degree view around, and then we have one big window in the center looking straight down at Earth. And uh, any free moment you've got, you try to get to the cupola. One day I was in my crew quarters watching a TV show on my iPad, and I had that epiphany that I'm in space floating, and I'm sitting in my crew quarters watching a show on an iPad. And uh, sometimes I guess you gotta do that, but I put down the iPad and head outside. So here I'll start with the uh, Canon video camera looking straight down. There's uh, some of the frame of the cupola, and then as we come up to the Earth, Earth rim, you can see uh, that's a great human eye perspective of floating the cupola and looking outside. Um, it is kind of hard to see, but uh, right there you can see landmass in the center right towards the horizon, and that is California. And you can, if, if any of you are familiar, you can start to see the Central Valley right there in the middle. Uh, kind of get some smog uh, stuck in there. And then you can see where the clouds kind of wrap around the edge. You can see where San Francisco is and the, and, the, and the fog there. And then over on the right is LA. So that's looking at the whole, whole west part of the US. Anytime you can catch the sun on a nice low glint, it gives this three-dimensional view of the planet that is really quite special. And it also highlights that atmosphere. And so, 
If you look at that picture right there and think about that little tiny fuzz, it's just a little tiny bit of fuzz. I expected way more, but it's just a little, little, little thin atmosphere. Uh, and that keeps us all going, which is pretty fast. Our, our Earth is amazing, and it only gets better when you look at it from space. Uh, right after we got up there, we went into this, uh, it's called high beta, where the sun never sets in our orbital track. And so uh, for the flight controllers on the ground, this is the worst because you never get cool. You never get an Earth's shadow. So our solar arrays, you can see they're parked. Uh, and I took a, one picture a minute for 90 minutes. So it's one lap around the Earth here. And you can see the sun just goes in this circular pattern forever. Um, and it gets real hot inside. And, uh, but it's, it's pretty neat when you're looking out. And you never get to nighttime. But nighttime was kind of my favorite. And I got to walk through this picture. And I'm sorry that folks watching on TV uh, probably won't get to the full exposure, but if you look, uh, you can see the, let me try to explain this the best. You can see the robotic arm is at the top and it kind of makes like a little scissor up there. And then just under the middle of the robotic arm, there's a series of about 10 really bright lights. Uh, they're orange lights and that is fire from uh, oil wells. And that is my lead into Iraq. So what we're looking at here is a, we're looking to the south and at the very bottom of that image is Iraq. And then if you look back to that series of like 10 lights, hopefully you guys are seeing them. I'm going to use this to see them. those lights right there. If you, if you follow that up, you come on to Kuwait, which is this first series of lights that you come to. And you can see there's roads, I think the roads, going out of Kuwait with a lot of street lights. And almost looks like little uh, Christmas lights, kind of ribbons of light coming off there. And then as you, as you go up to the, to the north, off just to the right of the robotic arm is one big uh, white city. And that... That should be Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And then as we work our way along the coast, if you go back to Kuwait and just work your way down, you can see the, the kingdom of Bahrain is right there and Qatar is off there. And then way off on the distance, underneath that solar uh, array of one of our cargo ships, I think that's the Cygnus cargo ship, uh, you can see the island of Dubai. I'm, I'm sorry, the city of Dubai is right there. And then everything on the left half is Iran. So I spent a lot of time over in that part of the world, and uh, really fascinating for me to get to look down from space and be able to see all of this in one quick shot. Uh, I've heard many astronauts say you cannot see borders from space, and maybe you couldn't uh, a number of years ago, but I'll tell you, US Border Patrol has done a phenomenal job of building this wall uh, that runs between San Diego, which is on the left half of the screen, and Mexico, which is on the right half of the screen. And you can look down and in an instant see the border of our country. Um, and then you get these days where the clouds cast these just thousand mile shadows that just go right off into nowhere. And uh, when you get to look out at that, it's really, that's just a special moment when you're, you're just so in awe, you're, you're basically speechless. I don't know how that looks. Trust me, that's better in real life. Um, and then uh, I love looking at this area. I think this is one of the neatest things to look at. Uh, you can see, uh, obviously, we have the Red Sea here. There's a river on the left, which is working its way north to the Mediterranean, that's the Nile River, and uh, it fans out into Cairo and the pyramids. Um, so we got the Nile over here, and the pyramids are about here. Um, and then as we work to the right, you can, you can see the Suez Canal, which is just off to the right there, and it works its way down into the Red Sea. You can even uh, follow the coastline up, basically in the center of your, of your image. Um, it starts to, the desert starts to turn gray up there, and all that is is humans building, and that's Israel and Lebanon. And uh, off to the right is Syria. And uh, I just think that's a, such a wild place. I mean, that's basically where we all came from. That's where it all started. And then you can barely see an island out in the Mediterranean, just under the clouds. That's the island of Cyprus. Um, another fascinating picture for me that I had to use the internet to help explain. Uh, we're looking at Bangkok. And you see the green lights just kind of scattered like marbles out there. Um, I thought they were city lights at first, but they're not. They're fishing boats. And they're fishing for squid. So they take these lights, they point them down at the water, all the squid come to the surface, take a big net, scoop them right up. And, uh, and that's why you get all those green lights there. So the internet solved that one for me. thought that was pretty fascinating. And I love this picture mainly, well, it's pretty neat looking, but mainly because this kid emailed me while I was in space. I, I think he was eight years old. He asked why you can't see stars at night. And I'm like, oh, you can always see stars at night. So I went down to node three, got in the cupola, turned out the lights. And I left the shutter open for about two seconds. So you can just see there is a little bit of blur here because we're going fast. But what blew me away, you can't see this in real life, but look at that red ring of our horizon. And then you see the green band where the green meets the yellow. Um, 100 kilometers is the boundary of space. That's when we declare ourselves in space. That's 100 kilometers right there. So you can visually see the boundary uh, where we head out into space. And I think the red and green 
are both atomic oxygen uh, releasing photons, and then the yellow, someone has said, is uh, sodium from uh, meteorites that have burned up in our atmosphere, but I'm sure somebody in here can refute that. Uh, but go ahead and debate. And then you can see, uh, you can just see our solar arrays just off that red there. That's that little weird stuff in the middle. Uh, but I think that's a great picture. Uh, sometimes you can look down and see a lot of beauty when you know kids are scared and probably sleeping in their parents' bedroom, but that's a, a great hurricane um, and what it looks like from up there. And you can't look at that and not see beauty, but I know there's the devastation and destruction under it, so you got to be aware of that, but I just love looking down on those. Um, I had to put this in there because uh, any, Californ any California people? Somebody's got to be from, okay, not many. Um, but you can, let's, let's start on the left where we got that little bit of green, and that's uh, kind of up over Canada, the northern lights. And then if we work our way down these lights, there's a, right at the bottom of your image, there's a cloud touching kind of a, an oblong circle of lights with black in the middle. And that's San Diego, I'm uh, sorry, sorry, San Francisco, and that's the Bay Area. And if you follow that coastline down to the right, there's a, a big set of yellow lights, and that's LA, and going down to San Diego. But the thing that I love about this picture is off in the distance, kind of in the right half of the picture, is just a, a white block of lights. And Vegas. <laughs> Vegas sticks out. Vegas sticks out. It was very easy to see Las Vegas. Uh, this picture sparked my, my post-ISS vacation plans. This is looking straight down on the Bahamas. I took this picture, I sent it to my wife, and I said, I don't care how we get there, but let's go to the Bahamas when I get home. And we did. Uh, so that was great. And then uh, you can never stop looking at the, at the southern, these are southern lights, southern or northern lights, and uh, the way they swim around. Um, it's just absolutely fascinating to watch those things go. Uh, and they, they really are swimming, and we're flying through these swimming green lights. Pretty cool. All right, this one was not taken with a 50 millimeter, so this is looking straight down over London. And you can see uh, the river that snakes through there, the River Thames. There's the, down at the bottom is probably the Ferris wheel that they built, very big Ferris wheel. And the reason I love this picture initially was in the river, you can see the shadows of the buildings. So look at how the buildings are kind of drawn along that river. And then if you look kind of towards the right side, and for the people watching on TV, they probably can't see this, but right there is the Tower of London. Uh, just on the north side of the river, Tower of London, and it looks like it's got a little pink outline. Hopefully you can pick that up on the screen behind me. Those are all poppies that were laid there for a war memorial, and I didn't even know this, but I put this online and people went nuts that you could see that from space. And then I went nuts, because I think that's wicked. I love it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how this, this has some audio, but if they can just leave the, audio, leave the audio down, excuse me, I can explain what's going on. But if you look just off on the, on the horizon, we're over, over the Atlantic Ocean now. If you look just off on the horizon, it starts to get a little brown kind of fog or smudge out there. And, uh, and as I look to the right, you can see this kind of brown is coming down. Now you can see it's kind of taking up half of the earth right there as you look. And I didn't know what was going on for a long time. I thought maybe pollution. I didn't really know. But this was the day that we figured it out. Sandstorm in the Sahara Desert is blowing up, and it's pushing particulate across the Atlantic all the way over to South America and into Brazil. I mean, really amazing to watch our Earth reshape itself and move a desert into a rainforest. I just thought that, that was, this was the day where I learned that our Earth is way more alive than any of us sitting here. It's really an amazing thing to get to see. Um, real quick, we're looking at, uh, this is all of Europe. And uh, the big city kind of in the center is Paris, and then off to the right is London. Um, and because we're sitting here in Maryland, this is, uh, this is where we are. Um, you can just make out the Chesapeake Bay there, maybe. And uh, so, yep, you can see the Chesapeake Bay, and then we're up in the clouds right around there. Um, and then this is that, that view looking straight down. So the bottom left, the first city you see is uh, Washington, D.C., and then you move up from there to Baltimore up into Philly, and I mean, look at Manhattan. It's just a huge gray uh, city, we'll call it. And then uh, the thing I really, I, I went out to the Appalachians a lot when I was a kid with my parents, and you can see the mountains and the way they curve around Pennsylvania off there on the left side and then start heading south. Uh, I thought that was real fascinating to look at. Uh, if you pull out the big camera, and uh, that's a little window down in the Russian segment, so it's a pretty tiny window, but if you pull out the big camera and you start looking down, you can make out your cities like Baltimore. That's where I grew up, just to the north of that. Um, and then if you really zoom in, you can start to see there's two stadiums there. There's Camden Yards where the Orioles play, and you can also see where the Ravens play, and then you can make out most of Baltimore. You could never do this with the human eye. This is taking an 800 millimeter lens, it's, you know, about two or three feet long, and, uh, and looking down on Earth. But it's really cool to do that, and you get a, a close connection with your buddies there. Um, 
Who, who has been through the, the Maryland August thunderstorms? This is the August thunderstorm that rolls across every single day. And so uh, you can see that you can just make out the coastline here. Chesapeake Bay is going up there. And, uh, and my parents' house is right about under one of those big uh, thunderstorms there. But I thought that was great. I mean, when you're a kid, you got to get out of the pool. And uh, those are always sad moments. Uh, and I'll narrate this one, too. Uh, so this is that night shot of all of us in this room right now. And so the city on the bottom there is D.C. That goes up to Baltimore. If you take I-95 to the right, you go up through Philadelphia and then New York City. You can see Long Island is just huge. Boston's on the far, far right. The sun is just starting to come up over the horizon. If you work from Boston to the north, I think that's Ottawa. And then as we go over to the left, uh, I think we have Buffalo, Toronto. And then on the far left, I think we got Cleveland and a little bit of Detroit sitting there. So, uh, And just remember, this is the camera just looking out the front. You know, this isn't all looking around that whole place. And so it's amazing. Uh, Italy, they're very nice. They outline their whole country. Um, so really fantastic. You're from there? OK, OK. Well, we'll get to Sicily in a second. So if you, if you, track, the, if you track from the north coming down, you see Rome and into Naples. And then uh, you, you take the tip of the boot out, and you hit Sicily. All right. And uh, it looks great. And uh, if you look down in, in the lower right hand of Sicily, there's a ring of black with a city to the south of it, and that's Mount Etna. And if you look right in the center of that ring of black, right there is lava in Mount Etna. So you can see down into the little, the little lava stack there. So that, people ask, what's your favorite picture from space? That's my favorite picture from space. Uh, that can't be beat. Uh, and then every once in a while, uh, you look out and you just see this kind of blanket of clouds. A lot of folks ask, uh, are there aliens? And you can't look there and not believe that there has to be life out there. And that's kind of NASA's charge, right, to find life. And I think we got to keep looking, because it has to be. It absolutely has to be out there. Um, I think what I'll do, because we got about 15 minutes left, maybe not even, is uh, let's fire off some questions. And I'll stop this, this brief kind of with that in the background. I gotta, I'm supposed to wait eight seconds to see if anyone asks a question. So and we if, have time for a couple of questions. Please wait to get the mic before you speak. Any questions? That's one, Nora. Nora. Yep, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, uh, what is your happiest moment in space? <laughs> uh, you got six months to think about your happiest moment in space. Um, I think being a rookie, I'm going to answer this from the perspective of a rookie space flyer. My happiest moment was when that third stage cuts off and you're in space and you get to look out that window at your earth underneath of you and you've probably dreamed about this your whole life. I had in some way, shape or form dreamed about that moment for my whole life and so I would have to say that's probably it. That's probably it. I think when you come in from a spacewalk and it was successful, there's a great feeling there uh, but that, that feeling of looking outside and going, wow, this is, this is fascinating, this is truly incredible, that's probably the best. Good question. When you went to space, what like items did you bring with you? What items did I take with me when I went to space? Um, this shirt was one of them that I'm wearing here. Um, I took uh, a couple shirts. I took a shirt from my elementary school, my middle school, my high school. Um, and then I took a few items for, uh, from some friends. One, one person sent me a watch, so I flew that. But we get a little suitcase. It's about this big. It's not much. It's about the size of a shoebox. And what you can pack in there, as long as you don't pack lead, uh, what you can pack in there, you can take to space. And so I had that. I had some stuff from my kids. I had a stuffed animal, some pictures of my family. But that's really it. You don't have a whole lot of luggage space. So that was that was. Oh, I took a yo-yo, and it was really fun to play with a yo-yo. You can never make it sleep. You know where you kind of yo it down and it just stops at the bottom. Doesn't work up there, but it was fun to play with the yo-yo. Good question. Yeah. Um. I'm curious, you were recruited in 2009, you qualified in 2011, so that pretty much puts you like at the end of the uh, shuttle era, right? So how did your training different, uh, how was your training different from uh, previous things and you know, how do you relate to the shuttle era astronauts? Uh, well, most of them have departed, so it's easy to relate to them. No, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we, we got a very little bit of shuttle in our, in our initial training because they just wanted us to see legacy systems. So we, we did an Apollo kind of course and we got to talk a bunch of the moonwalkers. We did a shuttle course so we got to see what a winged vehicle looks like. Uh, and then from then on, uh, it was all about space station, spacewalking, learning Russian, and controlling the robotic arm. That was the main 
focus of our training right there. And then, uh, and then once you get assigned to your mission, then it's really focused on launch vehicle Soyuz. So my, my knowledge of shuttle, unfortunately, is pretty limited, very limited, other than the fact that that basically motivated my entire life. So, <laughs> Could you uh, talk about uh, reentry back to Earth, both in terms of spacecraft and your readjustment? Uh, sure. Back to um, I, I think they save the best for last. If you're a roller coaster enthusiast, they definitely save the best for last. Uh, we get in our little spacecraft and you undock from the space station. About 45 minutes later, you do a deorbit burn, which is only a four minute burn. Uh, it just barely knocks off your speed a little bit and starts hurtling you back towards the Earth. Uh, and then uh, we have compartment separation in the Soyuz. So the little part that we're sitting in has two other segments that kind of get pushed away. And, uh, and that's when you know you're, you're all alone in your little tiny spacecraft, and you're definitely, definitely coming home. And those things get pushed away. And I just remember Max was sitting right here, and Max is like, oh, look, that thing out there is really on fire. And we look out the window, and there's just stuff coming off of it like crazy. And I was like, that's amazing to look out there. It was part of our spacecraft a few minutes ago, and now it's disintegrating. And then my brain goes, wait a minute. You're right next to that thing. This is exactly what's happening to you right now. You just have a heat shield, so you're alive. Um, and that was when it was just like, this is, this is nuts. And, uh, and you can see, I had a little window right here, and you can hear your reaction control thrusters firing. It's just like pop, pop, pop. And every time they fire, you get these little fireballs that go by your window. And then as you really start hitting the thick part of the atmosphere, the window turns from pink to red to maroon, and eventually to black. You can't see anything anymore. Um, and that's all just little bits of your heat shield, a blade of heat shield that are just kind of running up the side and getting stuck on the windows and all that. Um, and so, really amazing. And, uh, and you got your fingers crossed about like this. And, uh, and then the parachute comes out. You're still supersonic. Uh, you've just been at about five Gs. Now you're kind of relaxing a little bit so you can breathe. And then the parachute comes out. And then it's just crazy mayhem. And you feel like you're tumbling and flipping around. And you are tumbling and flipping around and spinning around. And then it all starts to quiet down. And you're just kind of coming down under parachutes real nice. But there's a few more surprises left because you got to jettison your heat shield. And they cock the seats up for landing. And so right when you're least expecting it, there's a huge pyroblast. The whole spacecraft starts to spin around. The seats cock up. All of a sudden, your window goes away. You can actually see outside. The cabin depressurizes once you're, I guess it's like 25,000 feet. Uh, so all this mayhem is going on. And then that all calms down, and you ride your way down. And, uh, and then the last hit is the, the landing in Kazakhstan, and it's a really hard hit. Um, and for us, we landed upright in our capsule. And so we were sitting there upright. It was real nice. Felt great, actually. Didn't feel sick at all. And after about a minute and a half of being on ground, we felt a little wobble. I was like, that can't happen. We've jettisoned our, our risers for our parachute. But you know what? It can happen, because our risers tangled up on each other. And so I'd taken my gloves off. I'd taken my books off. And we wobbled again. And then all of a sudden, there was a lot of Russian screaming on our uh, rescue network. And boom, we tipped over. And then we got a nice little sleigh ride across the Russian desert. And, uh, <laughs> and after about 200 meters, we came to rest. And now we're, we're stuck. And since I'm enjoying telling this story, I'll keep going. But I know, we're run, I know we're running out of time. And so now we're stopped. Uh, some Russian rescue forces actually jumped in our parachute to collapse it, which is fantastic. Thanks to those guys. They did that. Um, and now we're, we're stopped, and we're on our side. And so Alex is at the bottom. Max is there. And I'm up at the top of all these guys. And Max was really worried that somebody had gotten injured, because I'd already started taking my gloves off. I hadn't unstrapped, thankfully. None of us had. Um, and Max just asks, hey, guys, how you doing? Is anybody hurt? And I look down, and I'm like, Max, I think I'm going to throw up. And those guys were like, no. And you can see them grabbing their visors, trying to pull them down. And so luckily, I didn't. But then I felt really sick. I really felt sick. I, I never did throw up. Uh, but right then, I felt sick. Um, the rescue forces opened our, our hatch almost immediately. You feel this cold air of Kazakhstan come in. Great feeling. Um, and then they start pulling you out one by one. I was the last one to get pulled out. And you get, as you're going out, like I wanted to touch the outside of that spacecraft and get my hands all charred and black from all that. So I did that. And then they put you in a seat. And, uh, and there's more adrenaline than you could ever imagine right there in that moment. And so there's, I mean, they probably could have taken an arm from me and I wouldn't even have noticed. Um, there's a lot of adrenaline. And then the adrenaline wears off and, uh, and you just feel like gravity is really heavy. And your head is the, you never exercise your neck muscles. So your head's very, very odd feeling, very odd feeling. Um, like tossing my clothes that first night onto the bed, I missed by a solid four feet. You know, I just couldn't do, <laughs> couldn't do that. So, all right. Uh, we, hopefully we have time for at least one more question, maybe two more. Uh, well, thank you for coming today, sir. The presentation was great. Thank you. 
Um, I was wondering if you had read the book The Martian, and if you had, was there anything that you can relate from the book to your experience? Uh, I have read that book, and I, I don't know who talked to them when they were writing that book, but what, what really related to me was this interaction between um, the guy stuck on Mars and the control team back on Earth. And uh, there were some very, very personal, personal moments in some of the dialogues, and I was just cracking up because we had had almost identical moments with our control teams. And I really thought that um, it was, yeah, I don't think I can sit here and promote a book. But it was an easy read, it was really neat, and it took you on a great adventure of going out to Mars. And I thought in many ways that was, it felt like what life on the space station was like. You know, you're, you gotta be creative, you gotta think up new solutions. Sometimes ground is telling you one thing when you wanted to go a different direction and then you gotta re personally regroup and then head in the direction that this big team has put you on. And uh, I, I thought it was good. It takes you on a good adventure. Okay. So, all right, in closing, it's great to sit here. It's great to be in DC right near my home and uh, to get to talk to you all. Thanks to the kids for being here and being patient. And uh, I hope that was a good journey. And uh, hope to see you all again real soon. Let's Thanks. give them a hand. Thank you so much, Lee. We also want to thank our line audience, our TV audience, and of course, we want to thank all of you for being here today. This concludes the program. Thank you. <laughs>